All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this chill TP test we're going to be doing today. Hope you guys are all excited. With me, I have Fino and Dragon Bane on commentary. Hello. Hello. If you guys could tell us if the audio balance is okay, that would be nice, just to make sure. But yeah, so right now we're just creating our file, with file name round two. And let's get started. the game audio a little bit. Should hopefully be okay now. Anyway, we're starting right off with back in time, just like RTA would do. So we're gonna take this rock and we're gonna use it to clip through the Orden Gate and then backflip into the void while resetting on a specific frame to then respawn ourselves on the title screen. And from here we can actually take the dummy title screen file that the game uses and save it over as file one because it has some useful properties that we like to take advantage of. Yeah, they should be able to hear you guys. <clears throat> so something Jim did there that he's going to be doing a lot in the run is uh, basically he saves the file and resets. And the game actually tells you not to reset the console, but it actually saves the file to the log. And, like, it's really quick. It's like 10 frames or something like that. So he's actually hitting the reset button, hitting the reset button before he even presses A to save the log, just so he can get back to the file. So you barely even see the saving action happen. Yeah, they're all they saying you're too quiet. Fast on all right, Discord should be louder now. The beginning of this run is mostly just a lot of rolling around and collecting the lantern, so good time to balance the audio. If you guys could try saying something else. Oh, is everyone? Hello. It's me, Dibby. Also, yes, the language choice that we have for this run is the German version. Uh, the reason for that, even though Japanese technically is the fastest language, uh, the Japanese version has a glitch on it that was patched, which saves us 15 minutes in the run. So that's why we're not using Japanese. Something you may notice in certain areas when Jim is rolling, like right here, he'll roll and then wait a little bit before the second roll and then roll again. Um, that's uh, just to cover the maximum amount of distance at the like, top speed that you can achieve. Um, the, the speed scaling in this game is really weird. Yeah. Also, Jim uses uses uh, a lot of angle locking, I guess. You can explain this, maybe? Oh, yeah. Uh, well. I call it angle locking, I think everyone else just calls it analog glitch. But pretty much, uh, if you hold a direction and target for one frame, um, the control stick kind of gets locked based on where the camera was uh, during that one frame target. So it allows you to like turn the camera however you want without having to worry about the control stick direction being affected. Yeah, that's why you hear the camera sound a lot. <laughs> Of it, like fourteen. <clears throat> yeah, the glitch that doesn't work in Japanese is my glitch. Yeah, it saves probably twenty minutes, actually. That saves a lot of time. <laughs> 
Anyway, now it's time for the goats. Goats! Goats are fun. For reference, I think the RTA record here is like 15 seconds and then like, I don't know, 66 and a second or something like that, like 15, 60. Yeah. Yeah, it's like 15 and a half. Of course, this is a task, so we do it in a little over 14 seconds. This is not the actual test record, right? No, I think it is. Cause that, no, that is, yeah. Because yeah. mm -hmm. the cool. the previous test that, uh, or the previous work in progress that Fino and Rachel did got a yeah. 1433. Oh, really? Okay. Cool. All right, so right now we're actually going to enter Bo's house. Uh, we can do this right now because we saved over back in time, uh, back when we did it earlier. And so it set a flag that allows Bo's house to be open and allows us to come and get the iron boots way earlier than intended. Like this alone saves two minutes. Yeah, it also is a cutscene here that kind of like regulates this text. But um, because that only that cutscene only triggers when Bo's outside the house, so like the text is still there and he can still wrestle him, but he has to like keep talking to him to actually get to the point where he yeah. gives him the prompt. He's actually in the house by default, but the yeah. door is just locked earlier. So now this part of uh, the wrestling is actually RNG which moves Bo can do, but because this is a task, obviously we can just get perfect RNG. And the fastest way to get Bo out of the ring is by slapping him and then pushing him out. Boots at six minutes and forty three seconds. Pretty good. <laughs> pretty, pretty solid time. Yeah. <laughs> also, right here, uh, we went out the right door of Bo's house. Uh, the right door in a set of double doors always has the faster animation. So that's the door that we use each time. It also conveniently uh, sets us closer to where we need to go. So now we're going to be saving over file 2 for a glitch that we're going to be doing later called Early Monkeys. Good bonk. And wherever it's possible to bonk and not lose time, we're going to bonk. Nice. Yeah, doors are important. important. The right door is always first. I think there are some exceptions to that in a Hyrule Castle, though, where it doesn't matter which oh, yeah, it doesn't side matter. of the door you go through. Yep. Yeah. For some reason in Hyrule Castle... Because you Castle, come out of the same door. Yeah, you'll always come out the right door. Anyway, now we're a wolf. We've wrong warped into the Okami tasks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's like a single uh, uh, frame or two there where you can actually attack the box right as the cutscene triggers and break it, which just saves a small amount of time when digging out of the cage. Yeah, two frames, I think. I think. So now we see uh, a lot of wolf movement. Yeah, the sewer area is pretty much like the tutorial for Wolf Link. You'll also notice that we have the Hylian Shield and Orden's Sword on our back because we got those items thanks to Back in Time. <clears throat> back in time also, uh, or whenever you do back in time, Link's file name actually gets reset back to Link, so even though we entered in a file name at the beginning, it's not going to affect anything here. It's still just going to be called Link, and Epona is still just yeah. going to be called Epona. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah, this is all pretty st straightforward. You can't skip much here. Yeah, so most of the sewers is just movement optimization. Uh, there's actually a technique that we use called dash cancelling, where if we initiate a dash but then interrupt it with either a B attack or by some other action, like jumping off of a ledge, uh, we won't have to wait for the cooldown on the dash attack if we interrupt it early enough. <clears throat> yeah, what well, you see there where he's got the little jumps on the ledges, those are technically uh, dash cancels. <laughs> There's also these uh, first frame Midna jumps that we can get whenever we need to jump somewhere with Midna. Uh, if she has text uh, right before we jump with her, then there's a single frame right after the text appears that we can jump to her before you need to normally wait for like a second and a half. <laughs> I love the map spam. There's actually a text skip he did right there. I don't really mean you come out of that area and Minda talks to you, uh, but there's a frame where you can jump before he talks. This game has a lot of like dumb frame perfect things that just save a tiny bit of time. Yeah. And some frame perfect things that save a lot of time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just we'll see you later. Alright, so now right here we're going to save this file over slot 3, which is again going to be used um, to do back in time once more later. Pretty sure you've noticed by now, but Twilight Princess thankfully gives us the ability to skip a lot of cutscenes, uh, which is really nice. We don't have to watch that many. I actually don't know how long it would be if you watched all the cutscenes. Pretty sure it would add like seen. it would add at least like half an hour. I would assume. Yeah. Anyway, this is Hugo the Boldlin, and we're going to be using him for a skip coming up called Sword and Shield Skip. Uh, even though we already have a sword and a shield, uh, we need to skip collecting the Orden sword and the Orden shield, which normally we need to go get before Midna allows us access to the Twilight. But the trigger that uh, Midna has to try and stop us from going into the Twilight is only a ground trigger, and behind it there's an air trigger that allows us to go into the Twilight. So if we can jump into the air trigger without touching the ground, then uh, we can skip that trigger and skip the Orden sword and shield. So we're going to be using this Boldwin to do a long jump attack to jump over the trigger and enter the twilight. <clears throat> God, that's crazy. <laughs> I actually see that before, but I didn't realize you don't even wait for him to attack to do the jump. You just, like, walk back and then do it. It's just insane. Yeah, it's so fast. So now we're in Fair and Twilight. We're actually not going to be completing uh, this Twilight section. We don't have to collect any of the bugs. But we still have to defeat some Shadow Beasts. So the goal with these Shadow Beasts is that we need to kill two of them so that the third one reawakes them, and then we can go back to Midna to learn the Midna Charge. Uh, when we do spin attack them, we want to hit all of them on the same frame so that we only get uh, one hit stop effect. Because if we hit them on different frames, then we'll get multiple hit stop effects which we'll waste a few frames. <clears throat> and Jim also did something there that uh, I think he does on basically every Shadow Beast fight, where he actually doesn't target all three of them with the Midna attack, but he manages to line it up perfectly so that when he comes back to hit the second one, it actually hits the third one too, which saves time. some more single frame, like frame perfect time savers there. Whenever you dig out from a hole, Midna actually sits on your back 
and there's an animation where you have to just wait very briefly, but there's a single frame where you can dash before it happens. Like here. I did it again there. Yeah, so now we need to get through the poison fog area. And normally we need to do mini jumps across these pillars, but with some precise regular jumping we can just get across them. And yeah, saves the time of midnight having to go over to where you have to jump. And then right here we can jump down by doing long jump attacks off of the keys that are in this area. Which took forever to manipulate, but gotta save that time. And so now we're gonna do one of the bigger sequence breaks of the run called Early Master Sword. By using a super jump off of this Shadow Beast, we can jump way high upwards and get out of bounds. And then from this collision, we can jump to the Sacred Grove, which contains the Master Sword. So let's go get the Master Sword. I mean, you can try to do that in a real-time attack, but it's really hard. So as you saw there with the howling, you don't actually have to howl exactly uh, correctly. As long as you're pretty close, it'll count it. So you can kind of mess around and do goofy shit. Yeah, also right yeah, there. Yeah, you can always that. do memes. Yeah, lots of vibrato. Uh, you may have noticed back there on the ledge before I got the first hit on Skull Kid. Uh, I actually, it looked like I teleported up to the ledge immediately. Uh, there are a few ledges in this game that are like that, where if you, like, climb up at the very edge of it, you'll just kind of go up it immediately. Saves a few frames. Pretty much now we just have to go around attacking Skull Kid until he finally lets us go see the Master Sword. If you B-attack the Skull Kid here at like the perfect angle, uh, normally you're supposed to stay up there on the ledge where he just was, but you'll actually just spawn down here in the cutscene on the ground, which saves a little bit of time. It's actually, I had to do this before, and I, I remember it being pretty difficult to get like the correct angle to spawn down there. Okay. And then Skull Kid just kind of disappears. Because the, the developers probably assumed you wouldn't be able to get to him that fast. So during this section, uh, we want to collect some rupees, because we will need 300 rupees later to fix the cannon to go to City in the Sky. And on each one of these cycles, uh, we only want to kill one of the puppets, because if we kill multiple of them, then we get multiple hit stop effects. And the less hit stop effects we get, the more frames we save. For those who don't know what that is, it's sort of like lag frames for the game, so while you're hitting multiple enemies, the game will actually literally stop for a few frames. Yeah, it's meant to create like a dramatic effect when you deal damage to an enemy. So now we can play a slight variation of Zelda's Lullaby. There's actually like multiple solutions for this puzzle, but most of them are 
just as fast as the other ones. This, I think this right here was probably the easiest thing to task. <laughs> and you probably notice there's like, in between jumping between blocks, there's like a single frame where you can just do something. Uh, so Jim's just like turning on the senses and then that game immediately kicks him back off. And so now we get the Master Sword in under 20 minutes. It's <laughs> <That's> insane. <laughs> You know, the fastest masters were at the times, like you know, like a high twenty or something like that. Low twenty one. Yeah, so the Master Sword cutscene is unfortunately one of the ones that we can't really skip. But the Master Sword early on is very useful because it gives us the ability to transform between human link and wolf link while we're in Twilight. And it also gives us the ability to map warp uh, wherever we want using warp portals. And of course, uh, one other benefit of having the Master Sword is that it does more damage than the Orden Sword. It'll allow us to kill enemies much quicker. Also, less this warp anywhere. I don't, did you say that? I didn't, I didn't remember you saying that. <laughs> did I what? Did you say that the, the Master Sword lets you warp uh, yeah. immediately? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. How yeah. Sorry, how it does. The Master Sword does four damage. And one sword as well. <laughs> yeah, so now we're gonna go back through uh, the Farren Woods. And we're actually going to go straight to the Forest Temple. As I said earlier, we're not gonna be completing this Twilight section because that's not necessary. Now that we're, or yeah, we can, we did this earlier, but we can take a little shortcut through this cave as a wolf link. Saving a few seconds. <clears throat> also some, or one really weird thing uh, that I noticed is that sometimes between loading zones, uh, wolf link's speed just goes up to really high values for seemingly no reason. Hmm. Like a random thing I noticed while tassing. Anyway, we did a save warp there, and now we're gonna go to our third file again to do back in time. This is the file that's saved on the rooftops, so we can just side hop off and reset on a specific frame to activate back in time. We couldn't just jump off immediately because um, there's a text trigger that we need to avoid there. And so now we're going to load up file 2 after doing what's known as bytes back in time equipped. And then we're going to reset that file and then skip the cutscene it spawns us in as quickly as we possibly can, which will set an internal value in the game called the boss flag to a value of, I think it was, 39. And this particular value uh, is useful because it's also linked to the amount of monkeys that you have in Forest Temple. So because of this, I won't have to collect any monkeys in Forest Temple. I'm just going to get monkeys, pretty much. the heck is going on. <laughs> yeah, so so he does the back in time glitch to spawn on the title screen and then voids out to trigger a respawn while at the same time playing a file. And the file he saved earlier is set up in a specific way that um, 
it's going to basically load a certain certain room, a certain state, a certain spawn point on the title screen that's going to trigger the King Bubble in one fight, because the King Bubble in one fight is actually done on the title screen stage. Um, and then once that fight triggers, he can set the boss flag by doing the trick where you just reset and then skip the cutscene at the same time. It's it's kind of confusing until you really understand how it's done, but you know, it's it's all in an effort to to skip saving the monkeys. So and right here, Jim just skip the messengers again because it's faster. In yeah. test. Yeah, we don't need yeah. uh, the portal that those messengers spawn because we're never gonna come back to Farron Woods. Anyway, we can manipulate these spiders to never get us while we climb up this, uh, these vines right here. Stylish. Normally, if, yeah, normally if you try that in RTA, the spiders would probably decimate you every single time. Alright, so we saved one monkey. Uh, the one right at the beginning, we were forced to save that one no matter what. But now when we open this door, we're magically going to get uh, three more monkeys, which is enough to cross the bridge to go to the Gale Boomerang mini-boss room. So this is the effect of what we did on the title screen earlier, is now we magically get these three monkeys. And so we don't have to do basically any of Forest Temple. Now this is Ook. Uh, the, most, or the least amount of times that he can jump on the platforms is twice, so we manipulate that. And then with a single jump slash quick spin and a stab of the Master Sword, he's dead. Without the Master Sword, this would be a two-cycle fight, but thanks to the extra damage of the Master Sword, it's a one-cycle. broken item in the game, the Gale Boomerang. Gale Boomerang is going to allow us to do lots of fun things. And now we're done in Forest Temple. We don't need to complete Forest Temple. So we're just going to save warp back to the beginning of the dungeon and then go out. Faster to warp back to the one portal that we have right now. Because <clears throat> thanks to so, the boomerang, uh, or yeah, you can go ahead. Uh, so Jim mentioned earlier that uh, Warren won't be coming back to North Ground. There's actually a gold wolf there with uh, that teaches you ending blow. We actually do need that wolf, uh, but we'll be getting it a different way later on. Yeah, the one hidden skill, or the first hidden skill, uh, the ending blow, is required. If we don't get the ending blow later, uh, we actually can't deal the final blow to Ganondorf to complete the run. That's like the one requirement. Anyway, right here we're going to use the Gale Boomerang to do a long jump attack. And skip over the trigger that tries to block us from getting out of Farron Woods early. And now we're in Hyrule Field. And so for those not in the know, the long jump attack is basically just an kind of use of a targeting system. Uh, basically, if you target something that's either over a void or over higher ground than where Link is currently standing, Link will jump to it at a really high speed. Um, and when you throw the boomerang, if you don't move at all, you'll actually target the boomerang. So you can abuse that to throw the boomerang into out of bounds or just high up areas to let, let you jump really far when you're not supposed to. He's going to do it here to escape the postman. Yeah, and this is also the reason that uh, we choose the GameCube version for this task over the Wii version, because in the Wii version you actually can't do uh, the long jump attack with the Gale Boomerang, which is why it loses time. 
The actual long jump attack still works on the Wii version, but we think they accidentally fixed it because you can't pull out your sword without swinging it in the Wii version, which is what makes the target. Otherwise, it would work. Yeah, the mechanic is still there. It's just that um, you can't have your sword out while targeting the Gale Boomerang, so... Anyway, this is Elden Twilight. Uh, we're only going to be coming here temporarily, and then we'll be coming back to finish it later. Main reason we're here is because we want to defeat these messengers to get map warping. But I also want to get uh, the portal in Kakariko Village so I can warp back to Kakariko Village conveniently later also. So I'm going to do a one-frame jump attack here and then void out uh, in the gorge, which will respawn me near the entrance to this field. Because now there's actually a giant cutscene trigger around uh, the gorge. And if I touch that trigger, it's going to force me to warp back to uh, the Farron Woods, which I don't want yet. So to skip over that trigger, uh, I'm going to do what's known as the Rupee Roll, where I can get on this fence with a Rupee, and then backflip off. Then I can do the long jump attack again to jump over this giant gorge be on my way to Kakariko Village. God, that's insane. It's <laughs> crazy. So right here, there's a gate. Uh, but thankfully, gates are broken, so we're just going to run through it. There's actually one frame uh, during the animation of that gate swinging back and forth where the collision at the center separates very slightly. And so because of that, uh, we can then just dash through the center. It's worth noting, and you're going to see it here, but um, because Jim got the Iron Boots so early on and you're not supposed to have them, they actually tied uh, the King Bubble in one fight here later on to having the Iron Boots. So when you see Jim run around weird here, it's because he's avoiding that trigger. He doesn't want to hit it. Uh, because the King Bubble in one fight is not necessary, we're going to skip it completely. And then the cutscene trigger here for map warping is gigantic. You can actually hit it from the other side of the bridge, which is really convenient. <clears throat> and that, that jump attack he did to avoid this so that he could get the CAC warp was what we were talking about earlier. That that single frame jump attack actually saves uh, over a minute, or it's around a minute. So Jim takes the Force Warp, and then instead of going right back to CAC, because we have map warping now, he's actually going to go to Linear. Just the route works out better. Yeah, so now we get to dash across Hyrule Field once again. Very exciting. Uh, you'll notice that uh, Wolf Link's Shadow right now actually has Midna on his back. But Midna doesn't appear on Wolf Link's side because they're not in the Twilight currently. Which is kind of strange. They'll also be more visible up here uh, on a wall to our right side once we clip past this gate, also. So, just like the other gate, we bonk into it, and then during the animation, we can run through it. So we're going here. <clears throat> or, yeah, you can explain. Okay, so once you once you get to a certain port part of Lanera here, um, you, Jim just kind of waits because you have to wait for the area to load in, and once it loads in, it automatically warps you to uh, Lake Helia Bridge. And then of course he jumps in, and uh, he's actually going to go to Lake Bed right now. Um, 
The RTA strat here is actually to swim and do this as human, uh, but because this is task, we can actually RNG manipulate a ruby and then do a very difficult crit called ruby dive. It's actually clip out of bounds. And so once we've fallen out of bounds enough, we can just swim to the loading zone for the lake bed temple. Does trade is frame perfect. Yes, yeah. And then once we're inside Lake Bed, uh, at the beginning there's this long water tunnel that you normally have to go through. But if we save warp, we can actually teleport out to the first room instead of having to go through that tunnel. And that only works because we have the Master Sword right now. If we couldn't do early Master Sword, then we wouldn't be able to save warp to the front of the temple. Anyway, here's another gate, and we're gonna skip it. Poor gates, man. Now we can use some long jump attacks to get across this room. <laughs> the iron boots. Oh yeah, the whip you saw didn't use that, did it? I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, I actually ended up uh, tasting all of Lake Bed twice. Because uh, I missed a five second time saver before Lake Bed originally. Anyway, now we're gonna walk out of bounds up these stairs so that we can do a really precise long jump attack over to get Ugu. This is so we can return to Lake Bed later. This is one of my favorite strats. Hmm. God, that's crazy. Normally you don't you don't do you don't get to Uku like that. You have to do a much more slower way of, of doing it, but that LJ is like task only, so he's able to do that. Oh, it's just crazy. Yeah, Lake Bed is pretty much just a long jump attack playground. <clears throat> There's actually gonna go into the, the backside of the Deku Toad fight, which you're not supposed to be able to do anything from here. You just kinda see a locked gate and turn around. But um he, Jim actually has remnants of the boss flag left over because the the early monkeys doesn't deduct the entire value of the boss flag. He's, and as long as it's at least one, whenever you go into like boss loading zones, you can actually trigger the fight early. So he can just look up and it triggers the fight, which it's not supposed to do. Yeah. So the point of this fight is to defeat all the little fish, and then we can uh, anger the Deku Toad who tries to jump up and flatten us. I can see up right there to make him drop sooner. And then with 10 slashes of the sword, he's dead. <laughs> now we got the claw shot early. So from here we're going to save warp back to the first room of the dungeon, and then from there we're going to use Uku to exit the dungeon. Uh, the reason we save warp first is because we actually want to come back to the first room of Lake Bed later, so we're just going to do the save warp now to get that out of the way. Because with Uku, uh, we'll be able to come back to the room that we left from. You also can't Uku out of that room that he was in, so he would have had to save warp or leave normally, which is slow. So it kind of works out. Alright, so right here you'll notice that I'm not entirely running in a straight line. Uh, the reason for that is because, like we mentioned with speed earlier, um, if you're going uphill your speed gets decreased kind of significantly. You can't really notice it uh, if you're just playing normally, but in a TAS, or like when you're going through frame by frame, you can see the differences if you're uh, not walking on flat ground. So I was running uh, perpendicular to the slope so that I wouldn't get any slowdown at my speed in those situations. Yeah. Now, there's actually a way to uh, get around that and just run in a straight line without losing the speed, but unfortunately the technique to do that wasn't found until about, I don't know, a quarter of the way through this task. You're gonna see it whenever he goes into Elven Twilight. 
Yeah, that's one of the problems with long tasks like these, is that tricks will get discovered while the task is being made that could have made earlier parts faster. <laughs> nice LJA. The underwater LJA. Yeah. Anyway, we're gonna clip out of bounds with this Kargarok here. And fly through this area out of bounds. This map kind of zigzags, as you can see, on the bottom left. But if we're out of bounds, we can just fly through it pretty straight. So doing uh, the flight this way saves about, I think it's about like four to five seconds. Doing a normal yeah, it's like six seconds, actually. Uh, the game will try to like auto-correct where the cargo rock's going though, so I can't just like fly freely out of bounds. Uh, the game will try to like maneuver the cargo rock back to the center. Some uh, interesting angles. Well, there's another minute text here, but uh, he's just going to jump out of it. And again, the reason I'm not running in a straight line here is because uh, I get less slowdowns if I run in the pattern that I just did to get to the loading zone. Invisible hills. Although in some cases when I need to get around going over invisible hills, I can just use a keys to uh, long jump attack over. So Jim mentioned earlier, anytime there's text before mid and jump, you can actually, there's a single frame where you can jump to where mid is going to be. For some reason on this jump it doesn't work. It's the only one. It's very strange. Yeah, also there, I did a lot of uh, jumping up the slope that I was climbing because jump speed is faster than the speed that I would have had climbing the slope regularly. Now we got the warp portal at the top of Zora's domain. And now that we have that, we're going to go back and complete the Elden Twilight. Because we need the portal at the top of Zora's domain uh, to activate the Lineru Twilight later. Unfortunately, with what we currently know, it's not possible to skip these two Twilight sections. <clears throat> to uh, thaw the domain and complete uh, the Lineru Twilight, you have to use the meteor that drops in Death Mountain, and it won't drop until you complete this Twilight, so that's both bottleneck. Yeah, the only reason you do Elden is to start now. Yep. And normally you're supposed to start this by going into Renato's Sanctuary, um, but we can actually do a trick to do it backwards and skip the cutscene in there. Yeah, so as Human League we can actually clip into the well. Uh, from behind to get to the basement where there are three more bugs located. <clears throat> and again, this skips that whole section where you have to grab the torches and light them and move the statue. Save us a little bit of time. Now with this bug, we can actually agitate it by bonking from below, and then having it just kind of drop down into us. You'll also notice that I tend to push these bugs around a little bit, uh, so that I can get them closer to the location that I need to go to before they explode and uh, form their tier. Thank you. 
This bug here is actually kind of picky. If you're standing in the wrong spot, he actually won't jump down. Dash cancels up the stairs just because he's think too so slow and play. His movement. He is really awesome, awesome. Yeah, there was also a yellow rupee that I collected right there. Because again, I need 300 rupees eventually for the City in the Sky cannon. Yeah. And you'll see that sort of movement later on in Hyrule Castle too. Basically any area that stubs World Link's movement, it's going to be faster to actually dash and then be attacked to cancel the dash so that you get a dash again. Uh, in normal areas like outside here, it's not faster to do that. Just because the slowdown is so great after that dash, it actually saves time. Yeah, so more bugs, more rupees. Alright, so like I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, one of the problems with long tasses like these is that techniques will get discovered like while the task is being made that could have made earlier parts faster. And one of those techniques is brake sliding, which we'll see right after we crash through this window. So now you're gonna see Wolf Link do a lot of moonwalking all of a sudden, because this is when brake sliding was discovered. And so brake sliding is a useful task only technique, or it's basically task only. Uh, because it allows us to conserve speed as we go up slopes. And not get affected by the slowdowns that would normally happen. Right here we can do a precise jump over this ledge to get to this bug early. And kill it before it goes in the house, which will then kind of like despawn the house and give us the tears without us having to go inside. And there's a text trigger there with Nidna where she talks to you about the house. Um, which only uh, appears after you've gotten the tears, but... Uh, or after the house explodes, but Jim just ran around it, basically. So there's a lot of pots in here, which means lots of rupee manipulation. Lots of blue rupees. It's a nice rupee count. <laughs> Now it's time for us to ascend Break Slide Mountain. Let's do this. So because pretty much all of the ground here is sloped upwards, we just Break Slide through all of it. Break Slide speed trails very slowly. So he'll, he'll dash and then Break Slide and then wait a little bit. And then typically we'll dash again just because it's, it's quicker to get back up to speed and start a new one. Yeah, that's used in a few locations, but not very many. Only during, like, really long running sections as Wolf Link. It's mainly useful only as Wolf Link also. Uh, there are a few Human Link uses, but the, hu the bulk of the time save with Brake Sliding comes as Wolf Link. Uh, if I had known about brake sliding when the task started, it probably would have saved maybe like... Probably 20 seconds, I think. Yeah. There's a like uh, steam cycle. Like frame perf. Oh yeah, On so... This first test. There's this uh, steam vent here that we need to cross with a minute jump, and thankfully tasks can just barely avoid having to wait an extra cycle for the steam. Only by like a few frames. And that bug, uh, for some reason you have to wait for that bug to become vulnerable. But that's it for Elden Twilight. So now we're gonna break Malo's neck with a Wolf Link jump attack. a little funny thing we can do there. So this is the meteor that uh, Fina was talking about earlier that we need to come and get because it doesn't spawn until after we beat Elden Twilight.
the right here is Human Link. Uh, I side hopped out of a text trigger, and then I decided to go under the water with the Iron Boots uh, to get to like the main part of Zora's domain, and that allowed me to skip having to go through uh, trigger with Rutella, who normally would want to talk to us for a bit there. Now we can start the Lineru Twilight, which is the longest Twilight section. But it has lots of brake sliding, so it should be fun. So as Wolflink, um, your speed can actually vary depending on what area you're in. In some areas, your base speed will be 33, and in other larger areas, like Lake Hylia or in Hyrule Field, your base speed is 45. Which is why sometimes it looks like Wolflink is running kind of a little slower or faster than usual. It just depends on the area. Another like useful property of brake sliding is that it allows us to sort of orient ourselves uh, in useful directions if we need to go over like a switchback or something. So Jim skipped the Rutella cutscene earlier, and it's actually still here, so he's going to have to skip it again. Yeah. There was actually a way found uh, much later in the test that you can actually skip the Rutella cutscene as Wolf. Uh, so unfortunately we didn't get to implement that either, which saves like six or seven seconds. But now we get to do the Vine Claw Shot out of the Waterfall. Which is like insanely precise. Yeah. <laughs> That one so shot. Good. It makes it look easy, but it's actually it's like best. crazy precise. Yeah, that took like I think that single uh, claw shot grab took like three hours to get. I was like begging gymnast to, to do this. <laughs> Aside from collecting more bugs, we also get some more rupees. We get six in the grass right here. It doesn't waste any time because we have to wait for a few seconds after a tier forms before we can actually collect it, which is kind of annoying. That was one of the things that they actually changed in Twilight Princess HD, is that you can collect tiers immediately after the bug dies without having to wait a few seconds. Uh, this task started on, uh, I believe the date was March 15th, 2016. Uh, you can actually see the date that it started if you look at the save files uh, whenever we do a save warp, because I believe it should show the correct uh, time of, or the, like the, the actual day that the file was created. This is one of those situations we were talking about earlier where uh, we're going to do a really long brake sliding session, but because the brake slide speed uh, tapers off slowly, it's faster to eventually turn around and then start it again to get the higher speed.
And this is what makes the Linear Root Twilight so long, is the fact that you need to go and get this one single bug that's in uh, Castle Town. But it also gives us this warp portal in the process, which is useful. So here we're going to see some more dash cancelling, because, like I mentioned before, the speed in, uh, like, Castle Town and inner areas is just, like, it's just so slow that it's actually faster to dash, cancel the dash, and then dash again. And that bug, we had to wait until uh, it stopped, like, being in attack mode before we could get to it. Or before we yeah, could deal damage to it. Yeah, it's invulnerable until it hits the ground, basically. Alright, now we're back to Lake Hylia to collect a few more bugs. Let's do some more brake sliding. So some of the bugs are in uh, the flying section with the cargo rock. So we will be collecting these also. Now uh, this first bug we're actually going to bypass because if you fly past bugs in this, uh, they'll actually fly back towards you. So this one's going to appear on the top left. And it just runs into us like that. Uh, brake sliding is generally considered to be a TAS only technique. Because, like, you could take the time to do an RTA, but each individual brake slide use doesn't really save that much time. It's just that using it over the whole run is what allows it to save, like, multiple, or not multiple minutes. It probably saves, like, a minute to a minute and a half over the whole run. If I had to guess. Alright, time for the boss bug. <clears throat> you can actually do some interesting strategies here with the boss bug. So normally he's supposed to run around in the water and then attack once, and then go up in the air, and then attacks again, and then you can hit him. But you can actually stun him out of his first attack if you do it right. Basically you just climb with him right as soon as he hits the platform, and you can grab him again immediately. Like most bosses, there are three cycles to this. And then after the third cycle, uh, the game wants you to normally do like this giant charge attack on the bug. But we can actually cut that charge attack short to save time by starting it and then bonking on the bug, which will start the cutscene immediately of the bug dying. That's it for Linearu Twilight in just under one hour. It's pretty fast. Yeah, it's pretty decent.
Alright, so now we're going to be going to steal the bomb bag uh, from the canoeing minigame. And we can do that because we got Ruku back in the water temple, or in the lake bed temple, excuse me. And using Goku, we're going to get the bomb bag and then steal it for our own purposes. Yeah, normally when you're in the uh, bomb bag minigame, you can't really do anything other than save warp to get out. If you try to leave through the door, she takes the bomb bag back. If you try to save warp, it deletes the bomb bag. But they forgot to check to make sure you can't actually a coup out of there. So if you coup out, it actually takes the bomb bag with you. And yeah, so uh, here we're yeah here we're gonna be uh, playing the Requiem of Spirit so that we can then spawn uh, Golden Wolf near Hyrule Castle Town, and we're gonna be using that Golden Wolf uh, to learn the hidden skill, the Ending Blow, because it doesn't matter what order um, you go to the Golden Wolf's in or which ones you go to, uh, the hidden skills are all in a set order. So whichever Golden Wolf you go to first will teach you the Ending Blow. This little section, defeat these shadow beasts to trigger the minigame. Unfortunately, a little bit after Gemnus finished this segment, there was a new trick. Take this tower where it says 20 seconds and, and steps the wall bombs and egg bent. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we're going to steal the bombs and go back. I like that. But like DB just said, um, uh, we need to get water bombs to get permanent bag because we need to have a bag at the end of the game to do some tricks. Uh, and there was a way discovered pretty recently that you can actually get the um, permanent bag, which is the Goron bag, without water bombs. Uh, but when Jim did this, it wasn't known. So right now he's going to empty his bag to get the water bombs in that chest back there so that he can get the permanent bag. Yeah, so if I had known about uh, the trick to get the Goron bomb bag with just regular bombs, we wouldn't have had to do this. Now that we have the water bombs, we can warp out of Lake Bed and then uh, warp back to Zora's domain. And this is where. Uh, the Goron bomb bag that we get is located. The Goron's trapped in a rock in Zora's domain, and using water bombs we can blow up the rock and get him out. And uh, this is one of the reasons that German is the fastest language, is because uh, you probably didn't see right there, but the bomb text, or the text for the bomb bag was instant, which only happens on the German version. I'm not <clears throat> entirely sure why that is, but that text box is just kind of broken, I guess. And so if you're keeping track, he has a temporary bag from Iso with water bombs in it now, and then a permanent bag with regular bombs in it from the Goron. Um, unfortunately, he's going to save work in a little bit, and that's going to delete the temporary bag with the water bombs. But he still needs water bombs to fight the Lakewood boss. Uh, so what he's doing now is dropping his regular bombs as he goes along to Snow Peak, so that he can eventually get water bombs later. Yeah, so right now we're doing the map glitch, which will disable all the loading zones on this map. 
And this is useful in Snow Peak Province, uh, because normally if you try to go here early, uh, the game will uh, void you out if you go too far up the mountain without the Reekfish sent. But because we disabled loading zones, the game can't void us out like that now. So Jim mentioned that all loading zones are disabled here, which lets them climb the mountain. It actually disables the one that you need to dig into the cave coming up. Uh, so we have to um, figure out a way to get around that, because if he tries to dig in right now, the game is actually going to crash because the loading zone just won't uh, activate. Yeah, um, thankfully. So thankfully, the, uh, <laughs> the Howling Stone isn't affected by the glitch. So he's just going to come in here and howl, and then leave, and that'll fix Snow Peak. So now map glitch is fixed, and we can dig into this loading zone without the game crashing. And continue on our way to Snow Peak. He's gonna do a trick here to skip this messenger fight. Um, if you LJA far enough down, you can actually void out at a part of the mountain where you're really not supposed to be able to get to, with just like by just jumping off. And then that respawns you in the wrong spot. It's not supposed to spawn you. It's supposed to spawn you by the door if you jump off at the uh, top area. But if, because he LJA so far down, it actually spawned him up by Yeto, which skipped the the Shadow Beast fight and actually triggered snowboarding. Uh, one side effect of that, though, is if you don't do the messenger fight, it doesn't clear the area, like the fog effect that's going on. So he's going to have to do snowboarding with this like fog effect, which uh, in RTA is somewhat difficult because you can't really see where you're going. Uh, but of course, this is TAS, so we're going to see some really crazy stuff. <laughs> Yeah, so the fastest snowboarding speed that you get is while you're in the air. Uh, so we want to have as much air time as we possibly can, which we can extend by doing spin attacks in the air. Do some very high jumps. <laughs> and then right here at the end of uh, the snowboarding section, we can snowboard in such a way so that we glide along this railing at the end and gain some extra distance, which also skips having to go through a midna trigger. My favorite jump. Yeah, that's insane, man. Now we're in the Snow Peak Mansion. This is one of the more broken dungeons that we're in. Pretty much every room has a trick in it. Right here, uh, this ceiling doesn't have collision because normally you're not supposed to be able to get to it from under there. Normally you're supposed to, uh, I believe, blow it up as a bombable floor and then go through it. Dropping more bombs. Just to uh, get rid of them. Also, it's kind of worth noting... Uh, well, hang on, I'll mention that in a minute. Right here, he's gonna do a trick where he actually clips into the floor. And then go straight down, saves a little bit of time. It's just, uh, the, the collision there is weird, where all the objects meet that you can just clip straight from the floor. 
Um, but what, what I was going to say is you can actually, the only reason we um, are even coming to Snow Peak is because we want the dungeon item to stun Zan. Um, if it weren't for that one bottleneck, we wouldn't even need to come to this dungeon. And so this skips the cannon puzzle here. You can just run behind the Snow Peak and then open the door backwards. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, loading zones in this game, for the most part, if they're behind a door, uh, they're triggered by the door. So, like, you have to open the door for the loading zone to activate. You can't just click behind the door and load the fight. All right, this is the Dark Hammer. Uh, right here, as I kill him, there was actually one frame right before he died where uh, I actually picked up the ball and chain right before the cutscene. So... Uh, right when his death ends, I'm just going to immediately get the ball and chain, even though I'm nowhere near it. Uh, next to it on the ground. Here, I can kill an ice bubble to get an orange rupee before I save warp. Just more money for fixing the cannon. And then conveniently, right at the start of Snow Peak, uh, there's actually another orange rupee that we can get from another ice bubble. <laughs> before we use Uku to go back to lake bed. Uh, orange rubies are worth 100. Purple rubies are worth 50. And so finally, I think this is the third trip for a late bed, we are finally gonna complete it this time. We still have some bombs to drop though, because we need to empty our bomb bag uh, before we can get the water bombs. Uh, the game will only limit you to having three explosives out at once, so the second to last bomb I throw into a waterfall to have it immediately despawn so I can uh, more quickly pull out the last one and get the water bomb chest as soon as possible. <clears throat> so Jim never got the boss key, he's not going to need it. This is actually the only dungeon in the game where you can do a boss key skip because you don't actually open the door to go to the boss key, you open the door and then drop down to it. So the loading zone for the boss is always here in this room, you just have to get to it. Here we go. Yes, yeah, so now we have to sink down to the Morpheal fight. Um, thankfully, we can do this without needing the Zora armor. Uh, there's... Uh, because of the fact that we can do that, uh, we can actually completely skip the Zora armor. We're not going to be needing it. There's also another glitch that we're going to be doing in this fight that allows us to refill our air meter uh, without Zora armor. So after we quickly get rid of this eye in the first phase, I'm going to pull out a water bomb and then force unequip my iron boots so that now Link is holding the water bomb while he's swimming. And what that allows us to do is... When we move around and then let go of the water bomb, uh, we can actually refill our air meter that way. So that we can survive and defeat more fuel. Yeah, like when, when you do that, the game thinks you very temporarily resurface. And I just refill the air meter. Also, you go only need one, one bomb. Yeah, RTA usually has to do this fight with, uh, I think, two minimum. Uh, but because it's his task, Jim's going to do it just that one. You can actually do a trick here to put on iron boots and then attack Morfield. And normally you have to wait for her to throw you off, but you can force her to put the iron boots and that'll pull you off immediately. And then you can just keep redoing that to keep getting hits. And she's dead. So that was the first dungeon that we actually completed in the game. 
Uh, even though we've been to Forest Temple and Snow Peak earlier, this was the first dungeon that we actually beat a boss in. I think you might have jumped the gun a little there, Shrez, <laughs> with the time prediction. I believe we complete Lake Bed at like 16.01, or like 116 flat or something. Just because of how long this cutscene is. So with lake bed complete, uh, we get to the Minna's Desperate Hour section of the run. Which of course means more brake sliding. I forgot the heart piece? Oh, well. Looks like the task is ruined. Gotta go back and get the heart piece. Go back. <laughs> so you're gonna actually see Jim pass by the golden wolf he howled for earlier. Um, he's not gonna get it right now, and the reason is because this specific golden wolf, like the first one you get, has a uh, special because it'll always drop you a North Carolina after you do the attack or after you get the hidden skill. So he doesn't want to do it right now because it would drop him a North Carolina and. Uh, Minda's uh, sort of broken right now and won't be able to warp back, so you just kind of be stuck. So he's actually going to wait a little bit and do it later. So RTA usually will go across the ropes here, um, but it's actually possible with a really precise jump. You can just go to the right here and skip the rope. into the sewers we go after our introduction to Poe Souls. Now this area is actually kind of interesting. Um, this area has a base wolfling speed of 45, but it quickly lowers you down to 33. But with brake sliding, we can actually keep the 45 speed and move much faster than we normally should be able to. Another quick climb. Mm -hmm. 
So I have to kill that Bacoblin right there, otherwise he's going to annoy me as I try to cross the ropes later. Yeah, I think even with RNG manipulation, no, I don't think it's possible to skip killing him. He'll shoot you down pretty much 100% of the time. Some of these Bacolans we can uh, use a long jump attack to skip having to go across the ropes at the end of them. You get there so fast, it's like not even early cycle, it's like normal <laughs> cycle. <laughs> Good punk. <clears throat> and so, uh, Jim needs to go to Lake Kilian next, and since he has to warp away anyway, this is, and it's right by the Golden Wolf where it drops you, this is like the perfect time to pick it up. So now we go through the process of learning the ending blow. It's kind of interesting, since you do the ending blow with the wrong wolf, you actually spawn in the wrong spot. You Normally you're not supposed to be that close to him. But it kind of works out because you can smack his shield much quicker because of how close you are. It saves a tiny bit of time over getting it in North Huron. So spin attack is the fastest choice of movement or of attack to knock down the hero's shade. put you there. Yeah. And since we didn't defeat the Twilight, or we didn't, uh, like, free the area of the Twilight, right, yeah. it's this, like, weird hybrid state between, like, normal and Twilight. You spawn back there. Yeah. You spawn in the post-Twilight state, but the Twilight effect, um, which is separate from the state, never gets cleared. So it's like, you're in the wrong state, but the Twilight still looks like it's there. So it's kind of strange. begin a very exciting ladder climbing section. It looks very determined. This is very intense. She knows actually used to be to being this faster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it feels extra slow when you run the HD version. <laughs> We jumped off the tower. We didn't die though. <laughs> Jump off the watchtower. And here we turn back into Human Link uh, so that we can actually talk to the guy to get into the cannon. It also avoids. Uh, <laughs> Accidentally activating a cutscene 
with, uh, I don't remember the name of the bird, but he talks to you about wanting to do a mini game up through uh, Zora's River. Oh, uh, Plum. Yeah. Plum and we get to run across the desert. Uh, the desert has a lot of varying terrains, so we switch between brake slides and just like normal, normal dashing quite often. Normally in this area, you're supposed to steal a boar and break the fences that are directly in front of Link right now. Um, but that's slow, and we have the ball and chain, so we're going to do something different. Yeah, so normally right here uh, in RTA, you'd use the ball and chain to knock down this tower to get past this wall. But as Wolf Link, you can do a very oh, precise right. clip. Yeah. yeah, and then squeeze through there. Yeah. Yeah, normally, yeah, in RTA, you knock down a tower. <laughs> I forgot that that was a thing. <laughs> Here, we're going to get to see map glitch again. Now, we're going to abuse the map glitch effect, which lets you basically fall out of bounds without uh, pointing out. And uh, he's going to use it to hit the King Goblin 3 trigger, which is a special trigger that actually doesn't get disabled and is always available above and below the map. So he's just going to fall below the map and then hit it underground. That skips getting this wonky. And King Goblin just gets destroyed. Now we need to use this boar to get out of here. Now, we're not actually going to break uh, the gate to get out of here, though. We're just going to bonk on the wall and activate the cutscene that it normally happens. This cutscene looks kind of screwed up now because we did that. Normally, you'd see the boar like breaking through multiple gates. Yeah, basically, you're you're hitting the gates at the same time you're bonking, and it still triggers it despite you know keep bonking and falling off. So it looks really silly. Now we get to the Arbiter's Grounds, where we have a lot of stuff happening. So first we're going to break slide as human uh, across this sand pit right here to get to the other side. This dungeon is normally really boring, but in this test it's actually really good. Yeah, it's amazing. And also, something that Jim's been doing that I don't think we mentioned yet is anytime he needs to equip uh, an item that's not the top item, he actually still equips the top item anyway, and then uses that to like go to the other items. And for some reason, it just saves a frame every time you do it. Yeah, so kind of strange. If you, ever see but... the, yeah, if you ever see the equips and he equips three times, that's why he's doing that, because it saves one frame. All right, now the pose come out. Which is the only thing we didn't find a skip for in this dungeon. This is just reminiscent of the four pose in the Ocarina of Time Forest Temple. So we have to kill four pose and uh, get their flames back to their spots so that this gate that now closes down can open up again. Yeah. 
Yeah, so we can't skip the four pose, but we can skip the first one at the very minimum. Yeah, the game assumes that uh, you won't be able to get to the second, third, or fourth pose uh, if you don't get the first one. So it doesn't actually check for the first one when opening the gate. But thankfully, we can actually get to the fourth Poe early and use that Poe to get the Poe sent instead of the first one. And then go get the second and third ones. And what happened there was really quick. Basically, he did a uh, break flight across the sand to get to that pillar, and then backflipped onto the pillar and then used it to slide off and grab a ledge, which you're not supposed to be able to grab this early on. And Aver gets to an area that you're not supposed to be able to get to. And that lets him basically do the Poe's out of order. So this is the fourth Poe. Uh, it creates three copies of itself, and then will pretty much just fly around you. Uh, the amount of times it does fly around is RNG, so we can manipulate it to be the shortest or the least amount of times. And it happens twice. And we can kill the Poe right by the door that we need to go out next, so that we don't waste any time going through the door. We also get to close up of Wolf Link's nose. Nice out of bounds camera. So here we're gonna push this block uh, four times so that we can access this area again uh, where we want to go get the third bow. Because it's faster to get the third bow by going up and across the top kind of backwards through the intended sequence. And if you're wondering why you pushed it four times instead of just once and then running out, a block's position actually doesn't save unless you push it four times. Yeah, so right here we need to turn this pillar uh, to turn the walls to access a small key. But we can get hit by this bubble during the animation and then gain control much earlier. None of the other poses spawn copies of themselves. Their fighting process is just kind of all the same. And by getting hit during the animation of trying to extract the pose soul from the pose chest, uh, we can do some movement before we actually collect the pose soul and get closer to the door. And during this cutscene, the bubbles in the area are pushing us closer and closer to the door, which is very convenient. Once again, getting hit out of the push there <clears throat> to save one of the time. It's actually interesting, he opened the door there so quick that the column didn't get a chance to turn all the way. And if we had to do the dungeon normally, we would actually be stuck and have to reset the dungeon. Because that, that column controls the room above it as well, and because he exited before it turned all the way, if you were to go into that room above it now, there would just be a wall and he couldn't continue on. But thankfully we're not doing the dungeon in normal order, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, so uh, in in this dungeon, um, Wolf Link's jump speed is uh, kind of hindered a bit. Normally his jump speed is a bit uh, faster than what it normally is. So instead of usually jumping off platforms, we do a B attack off of them, because a B attack is higher speed than the jump speed. And then here we're going to kill this Redead, and then dig to unveil this chain. Uh, the Redead's going to drop a red ruby, which will complete 300 rupees that we need for the City in the Sky cannon.
Now we don't have to collect the small key in this room, because normally that small key would have been used on this door right here. But because we got a different small key and then opened that door from behind, uh, the lock fell off. <clears throat> and here you can see that the gate is going to open despite only have three souls, because there is no deck for the first soul. And so for the second half of Arbiter's Grounds, we're actually going to be going through it kind of backwards. Uh, we're going to clip through a pillar here to go and get the boss key early. Uh, the boss key is very badly protected in this dungeon. Even the uh, bug limit and glitchless categories can get the boss key early. And in this next room, we're going to be doing some parkour on these railings. Because normally these railings are slippery slopes, but we can roll over them enough uh, to save time getting to this door over here. That's crazy. <clears throat> and right after that, we can do another break slide to skip having to transform into wolf to cross that pit. And then roll through the gate as it opens. <laughs> the optimization swing is crazy. Alright, time for Death Sword. First phase is pretty standard. Basically just gonna attack him as soon as possible. Alright now for the second phase, uh, we're gonna turn the human like temporarily to sort of agitate Death Sword and get him flying around quicker. Then we're gonna transform back into Wolf Link and lure the Death Sword over to this side of the room. And using a mid charge, we can lock onto his head. And after he flies up, we can use that height to jump up and skip the gate that normally blocks the spinner chest from being accessed early. Yep, so we just skip the fight, we don't even finish it. And now we can save warp back to the beginning of the dungeon, because we can't exit this room anyway. Because we've already done the first part of the dungeon, we don't need to go through it again. Uh, or we do need to go through it again, but we can just like roll past everything. Jim's gonna be doing a few spinner groups here to like raise either raise platforms or turn turn the room. Um, and if you stop spinning, you'll actually stop rotating it too. But there's a single frame which you see right there where it's pretty much guaranteed it's gonna finish. So you can actually jump off the spinner and roll. So you're gonna see him do it again here in a minute. Oh, but first he's gonna do this uh, really silly LJ to save like a second to get over to the thing quicker. start this spinner sequence. What test? Time for the best boss. <laughs> One. I don't know about you guys, but I personally don't really feel ready to fight Stallard. I don't know if I'm... I think he's, he's too... He's scary, man. Yeah, he's too intimidating. I don't like him. Mm. 
I don't know. Let, let's get let's go up and get a good look at him first. Let's, let's see what he is. Oh my God! Wow. Uh, let Let's not fight this thing. Uh, let's just go past it. How about that? <laughs> let's just pull this guy over here. Swing our sword a few times. Flip through this wall. Flip through another wall, and we'll be on our merry way. <laughs> yeah, that was Stallard's skip. It's it's very much Tess only. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's and so it's much. Probably one of the coolest tricks of the run. Saves almost three minutes. Yeah, there's there's so much precise stuff that goes on in those ten seconds that there's no way I could explain all of it during the process. Basically, he does a trick called claw shot actor displacement to pull uh, the skeleton over to where he is into the corner of the wall. And then he claw shots the skeleton when it's in the corner and does an L slide to get out of bounds. And then does the exact same thing, but with a bomb, because he needs to actually flip another wall. And basically just has the bomb interrupt him on the exact perfect frame to boost him through the wall while he's all sliding. And then that lets him use the loading zone. Yeah, so right here, uh, normally we need to use the spinner again to go up and activate the Mirror of Twilight portal slab thingy. But if we zoom in all the way on the map, we can actually warp away. Uh, normally, Minna tries to block you from warping away, but for some reason, if you zoom all the way in, then activate the warps, um, you can warp away without getting blocked. <laughs> yeah, and you see that the uh, the whole uh, Renato and the gang are all still there. Because we never uh, went and wrestled, or not wrestled, but uh, went up to Death Mountain and got knocked off by the Goron. So they just kind of stay there. <laughs> that trick's called uh, City in the Sky early. Basically, you just transform up against the statue and it lets you clip the statue. That's the trick that lets us skip uh, Temple of Time in the second half of Snow Peak. Yeah, that, uh, that single trick alone saves like an hour. Including... Gora mines because you need the bow. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> now that we have our 300 rupees, we can go over and get the cannon fixed. City in the sky. Off we go. I'm excited. This is this is all new to me. I've, I've actually seen like working podcasts up till our first grounds, but I've I've not seen anything here. Same. Here to the end. So I'm really excited. Yeah. Especially for the first big trick in this dungeon. I mean, early boss key? <laughs> <laughs> the second one. I, no, he means the LGA over the, over the room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, we still have to go through this long cutscene before we can actually get started. Alright, let's begin finally. We're gonna have some serious shenanigans here. Yeah. 
So right there, I actually was able to pull out the claw shot while I was brake sliding, and then immediately began aiming with it after my brake slide was over. A little small optimization. Uh, right here, we can just basically do lots of LJAs. Uh, City in the Sky has lots of hits and voids, so it's prime long jump attack material. Uh, right here, I'm turning into Wolf for the sole purpose of opening this door from as far back as possible. Because this will skip activating the fan that normally blocks the boss key from being obtained early. So right now we're just going to go get the boss key first. Since it's more convenient to do that. And of course we get all the two frame grabs. So fast. So to, uh, to explain early boss key a little bit more, um... When you enter that, that main room where this fan is, um, right before you enter that door, there's actually a trigger sitting in front of the door that turns the fan on. And what happens is you can actually open the door as Wolf Link without hitting the trigger, because the game doesn't count Wolf Link as hitting the trigger until his back feet touches it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, right there, uh, I had to come down here without taking damage due to a trick that I'm going to do in like a minute. So I had to figure out a creative way to get down as fast as possible without taking any damage. That was crazy. <laughs> what the hell? Anyway, uh, so so he gets he opens the door from as far back as possible, and then as soon as Link starts the opening door animation, it unloads the trigger, so he can just walk straight through it, and then that lets you just go up and get the boss key immediately. Yeah. So right now I have uh, two and a half hearts. I'm gonna be going down to one heart uh, pretty soon here. Okay, guys, let's get ready. Yeah. So we don't have a small key, so but we need to go through this area, so Jim's going to do some pretty creative stuff. Yeah, this area down here is protected by a lot of invisible walls for some reason. It was pretty tricky getting down here. Yep. But now that we're down here, uh, we can do claw shot actor displacement a few more times on these uh, claw shotable pillars. So every time I'm doing Claw Shot Actor Displacement here, I'm actually canceling it right after I begin it so that I can move uh, these pillars forward and upward. And then this pillar over here, I can use a bomb to interrupt so it stops moving. And then from here, I can use another bomb to blast myself on top of the first pillar, which unloads uh, textures thanks to the camera angle. And then from here, I can bomb boost myself again up onto this last pillar, and from here, I can use the Claw Shot to get up to these vines and skip the small key. God, that's nuts. First person to do that. All the way over to the. Oh, that's yeah. <laughs> yeah, we got the LJA all the way over. That's insane. First person to do that in real time gets $100 from me. It's amazing. Wow. Oh my god, that was. Hey, and here we can scare the Dynalphos away with a claw shot. Yeah. Now the Dynalphos actually try to like pull up their shields to block uh, like the claw shot potentially hitting them, but in the process they step back slightly so they both just kind of fall off the ledge. I also regained some hearts right there because it didn't waste any time, and I need three hearts to lose two hearts again for a jump that I'm going to be doing in a minute. And then we can skip having to activate a fan uh, right there, the precise ledge grab. <clears throat> and that's where we lose two hearts on the jump down here to the Arolfos room. Kind of worked out well, too, because in that room where he got the heart, he actually has to wait very briefly because the fan doesn't activate immediately. And then here he's going to do a trick where he falls during the cutscene, the frame perfect one. And that basically is just going to drop him straight into the Arolfos fight. <laughs> and 
Uh, most people know about this, but uh, there's one pixel you can grab to skip past the gate that tries to block the second claw shot that you obtain in this dungeon, so that was the Aralfos skip. Now, uh, if you've watched RTA runs before, you'll, you might be kind of confused, because normally in the RTA run, uh, Link spawns back by the small key chest that you normally get. Uh, but because we skipped that small key chest, we don't actually spawn back there. So we have to go back the regular way. So now we will actually be activating the fan that blocks the boss key, but it doesn't matter because we already have the boss key. We have to go around this guy. He always spawns in the center of the room. So Jim never activated the fan in this room. Um, so he's going to do some shenanigans to get around that. Yeah, so if you're high up enough uh, when you grab these panels, you can actually grab the top of them, even though you use the claw shot on the grates below the top. Get across here. And then we can do a double LJA to get down and get across this long, open room. Alright, so right here we got a bunch of precise claw shots coming up. I'm actually shooting the claw shot for a frame uh, as soon as I can, because that'll actually give me control of the claw shot quicker for movement. And oh, then... We'll Right here, I can take an alternate route uh, up the right side of the room. And grabbing up high here allows me to grab on top of this panel right here and do a really precise claw shot grab onto the medallion right before the boss door. That's crazy. Yeah, so the, the second to last and the third to last uh, claw shot grabs in that room were frame perfect and basically pixel perfect. Like, that took me so long to get, but it saved, like, 10 seconds. I'm pretty sure Prax actually did that in his, uh, segmented run. Which is, like, nuts. Alright, time for Argarok. Uh, there's nothing we can really do for the first few seconds of the fight except watch Argarok fly around. And wait for him to come back here. <clears throat> yeah, he doesn't shoot the tail as soon as absolutely possible because that actually soft locks the game. Yeah, you need to wait a frame. Uh, <laughs> from the first possible time you could clush out the tail, because uh, if you do clush out the tail on the first possible frame, uh, like, Argarok won't really be affected by you, and he'll just, like, fly around as if you're not on him. But you can't get off of him either, so you're just kind of stuck there. second phase of the fight with the P-Hats. So right at the beginning of this second phase, we're actually going to jump off the map and void out. Uh, this is to reset Argrok's position so that we can attack him sooner. With the Iron Boots, uh, we can get Argarok's attacks to kind of end a little bit early. 
uh, which will now allow us to clutch out the package in that he has earlier. camera pins. And I needed to get that heart right there. Uh, because if uh, there's another jump I'm going to be doing in a few minutes that loses me two hearts again. So that was necessary. something interesting that he's doing here where he, he's actually intentionally going to the pillars in front of Argorok to make him uh, scream quicker, which may, or make him attack quicker, basically. Um, which is uh, it's pretty interesting. I, I've never seen anybody do that RTA. Yeah, because of how fast we actually claw shot onto the pillars, uh, Argorok notices us when he's pretty close to the ground and can begin to shoot his fire much quicker. Which is why we can also cancel it so early. Yeah, I guess that pitches on uh, being really quick to the pillar. So now we get the one mirror shard that's actually required. Uh, the Mirror of Twilight will only check for the City in the Sky piece of the mirror. It doesn't check for the Temple of Time or Snoopy Gruen's pieces. Sub-2 City in the Sky is pretty good. I'm going to equip the Iron Boots here right before going into the cannon because the Iron Boots were... Er, the Iron Boots are going to slow down my speed after I respawn in like Hylia, and if I do a jump slash as early as I can, I can get onto the bridge and instead of falling into the water, which is what normally happens. Just lets you work away immediately. It's also why you had to get the heart in the grass, because that does two hearts of damage. Now it is time for the Palace of Twilight. There's a lot of movement optimization here. Yeah, this dungeon uh, has the most brake sliding as human link that we're going to see. Like, there's a lot of tiny little optimizations in this dungeon. So basically, uh, in each room that we go into, there's going to be a small key that allows us to progress to the next room until we get to the Xan fights. save time by equipping the iron boots whenever we need to fall somewhere.
So you can actually double hit the Zant heads with a minute charge and that'll kill them basically with one attack. But I'm assuming it doesn't work on all the heads. I know it works on that first one and another one later on. Yeah, the collision for the second one is weird and like I couldn't get close enough to do that no matter what I tried. on there to save like a single frame. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Time to fight Zant. Uh, by time and get some really precise combos, uh, we can just defeat him in one cycle. It's like three frame perfect attacks or something like that. Yeah. Three frame perfect combo initiations. And then this fog is kind of weird, you can just kind of roll through it if you do it correctly. <laughs> That's crazy. And then we threw the Saul uh, onto the point where it would trigger the cutscene, during the cutscene of the hand just, like becoming alive. So uh, the, the two cutscenes just kind of stacked onto each other. We also have only had a quarter heart for like the past few minutes. And it stays that way for a while, which is kind of interesting. So I have to avoid getting hit by any and all enemies until I can get another heart. Particularly that set of uh, small Twilight enemies was really annoying. Right here, we can do a break slide as human link because this ramp slopes upwards. Oh, interesting. We can do this LJA to the other side right before the cutscene activates and it tries to talk to us. So the LJA happens during the cutscene. Here we can do a small, shorter range LJA, just hit the platform a few frames quicker. Quickly kill the Zan head. Speedy. Yeah, there are no, uh... I mean, like, there are no easily accessible ways to do a full way, or a full speed long jump attack, so... Um, the half-speed long jump attack was still enough to save a few frames. So this side of the Palace of Twilight has many more enemies in each room we have to defeat. I was going to be impressed if we made that. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> I couldn't quite make that. Yeah. On this next shot though, I can make it before I go into first person though. Nice. <clears throat> and here we can do a uh, LJ to save a few seconds. So 
same thing with this uh, Phantom Zant. Just some precisely timed uh, combo initiations. And on the fourth one, we finish the combo. So this is all we have to get closer to. Uh, because the cutscene activates sooner. Yep. Saul back. There's a frame in between each of those cutscenes that I can use to roll and get as far as I can over this set of stairs. Well, he about gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that case was actually really annoying. I was surprised that he followed me all the way up there, which normally doesn't happen. And here we have to wait for the platforms, unfortunately. Nice. And right here we can do an LJA back and then grab the salt. Oh, and that's insane. Side. Oh my god. So smart. And that saves like that only saves like 15 frames, I think. Yeah, I, I didn't imagine it was much, but jeez, that's crazy. Then you throw the salt here, right? Yeah. Throw the salt, and then we can get to the platform quicker. some wiggle walking. <laughs> now it's time to get the infamous butter sword. Break sliding uh, will save time up this second ramp because I actually need to pull out the sword. Which I wouldn't be able to do if I was rolling. Uh, rolling and break sliding individually are actually the same speed, but pulling out the sword is what saves time for break sliding there. It doesn't even look like you swing your sword, that's crazy. Yeah, so right there I'm swinging my sword for one frame, but then interrupting it with a roll. So the fog still moves out of the way. Now we get to the platform waiting. <laughs> you gotta keep it. So we need to defeat all these sandheads to get a small key. And so right there, it looks like I may have just done like a useless long jump attack, but I actually did that so that I could uh, time a spin attack on the three orbs correctly. So that the platform now exists and I can go back over to it without having to turn it on again. second time save LJAs. Alright, so here we're going to go and get the boss key first. Uh, with a really precise claw shot grab, we can get to one of the higher uh, claw shot targets. Get to the boss key. Get to watch 
watch all these Carter Rocks follow us. <laughs> Fortunately, they're all gonna die. Uh, the reason that I killed those card rocks is for an upcoming long jump attack to get back to the regular uh, part of this area after I kill this Xanhead. If I don't kill those card rocks, it makes doing this LJ pretty much impossible, because they'll just be constantly attacking you. So this room has uh, a platform cycle at the top that I need to hit. So as long as I can get to that platform cycle on time, it doesn't really matter what I do. <laughs> this is sick LJ. Yeah, there's not really much to do on these platforms, so we just like around a little bit. I'm targeting with the boomerang. And we can gently lower ourselves down to this platform, which is the cycle that we needed to make. Also, that we could get this small key. So here we just have to kill a series of shadow beasts that continually fall down. Once again, we want to kill them all on the same frame so that we only get one hit stun effect. And we have to wait for this wall to despawn before we can go to the door. So we just walk away from the situation. That was crazy. All right, time to fight Zant. So Zant has a few different phases that basically rehash um, old bosses that we never fought. first phase is the Diababa phase. Diababa is normally the boss of the forest temple that we skipped. And this fight can actually be done in one cycle uh, with some precise jump attacking. <clears throat> yeah, basically if you hit him like the frame he's going to spawn away, he'll just stay there and you can keep hitting him. Do something similar on this fight as well. Yeah, so for these fights, um, or for most of them, the only attack that really matters out of the combo is the fourth hit. So some of the fights you'll only see me make contact on the fourth hit to avoid the hit stun effect on the first three hits. And now we get to the longest phase, the more feel phase. And 
once again, we have to use uh, swimming with water bombs to refill our air meter so that we don't drown. <laughs> and the, that, uh, the head that he spawns in is always the one that's the story from you. Oh wow, you actually got him. He was fired. I didn't know that was possible without Zora Armor. <laughs> and yeah. the last frame unequipped. That's crazy. That's not I don't have to unequip the iron boots in this area. I mean it didn't really matter because I had to wait a few frames before I could hit Zant in this fight. And we can use the ball and chain to knock him out the center platform. Alright, now it's time for the one required use of the ball and chain in this run. So once again, we only need to make contact on a fourth hit to two-cycle this fight, and we can run around in circles. get to the final phase. Uh, for the first two cycles of this final phase, Zant will just spawn and I'll immediately uh, try to hit him with the fourth attack of a combo. Uh, for the last hit, he's going to try to come at me with a spin attack, but if I spin attack him into a wall, he despawns and immediately comes back with the regular attack again. What? That's insane. We don't have to wait for him to stop spinning around. That's crazy. I didn't know that. <laughs> That was so fast, holy shit. Didn't know about it? Did you I didn't know, no, 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 I didn't. That's funny. That's really fast. And so now we're done with Palace of Twilight. What if the task chokes? Well, I don't know, we'll have to see. Hopefully the task can keep it up, it's been doing pretty good so far. Once again, uh, to avoid having Midna block us from Warframe, we have to zoom all the way into the map uh, before we activate the warp portals. So now we can be on our way to Hyrule Castle to finally finish the game. And right here we can skip a Mailman trigger uh, with a long jump attack. Convenient anyway, because we need to stay as Human Link. Uh, for the rest of this. <laughs> Time for everyone's favorite cutscene. The Squidna. Cutscene is very optimal. You cannot go through this cutscene any faster than what you're seeing right now, ladies and gentlemen.
All right, and in we go. So there's actually barriers here in the uh, castle. The fights you're supposed to do. Um, Jim's not going to do any of them though. He's going to skip all of them. This first one, you can actually do a really precise LJ onto this hedge, and I get to pass this one. That's barrier skip number one. And then this one right here is really difficult. So you got to roll into the barrier, and then uh, skip the cutscene, and then just roll out before it forms. <laughs> if you skip the cutscene uh, fast enough and then just roll out, you can skip this. That cycle, or that one cycle, only works with like a specific combination of uh, spin attacks. Because in this game, you can actually spin attack two ways, clockwise or counterclockwise. Uh, and the, what is it? I believe the clockwise ones uh, are the ones that are one frame shorter than the counterclockwise ones. But the. There's a, there's a minion text here. But he's going to side out before it triggers and then save warp to dodge the text altogether. Here, even we'll though we go through, uh, even though we go through the left door, it doesn't matter because we'll come out the right door since it's a loading zone. And there's another barrier skip. Now we get to fight a dark nut. Unfortunately, this is the one barrier we can't skip. Oh yeah, I forgot about those. Ones. We can beat him really quickly with the ball and chain. And right after this, we're gonna use the boomerang to target some spots around the room. So now, while this cutscene of the chest forming is happening, the boomerang's flying around the room, and it will get to a position to extinguish the torch on the other end right as this cutscene ends. Which is faster than throwing the boomerang after the cutscene ends. Crazy. Now we get to see the return of the lantern. Uh, well, the ball and chain only has one required use. All of these other uses can be skipped, except for the single use on the Xan boss fight. Now we can blow up these two guys with a bomb. And I'll see us. That was the final bomb. Managed to use all our bombs in this run. And just defeat the Aralfos and wait for the barriers to go away. Also, yeah, the room with the uh, torches previously it requires you to light them in a specific order. So I couldn't, like, just light them all uh, in the shortest path, unfortunately.
Thank God you were saved by all these people. I know. All these people that we've met throughout our journey. Like, for two seconds each. And one person we never met. Final claim. Yeah, so normally uh, the blocks in this room fall because they want you to go through a certain order, but if you roll fast enough, you can just avoid them, or like you can roll over them before they fall down completely. Managed to fit in a sword twirl right there. Sick. <laughs> One tough dark nut fight. Now it's time for everyone's favorite boss, Puppet Zelda. This one's gonna be fa fast. fast. <laughs> this one's gonna be fast. Seven. It's gonna be seven. You think it's gonna be seven? I'd probably put my money on seven also. So yeah, uh, the Zelda, or the Puppet Zelda fight has a required seven cycles that uh, you have to go through. And in between each cycle, Zelda is on a timer that's random. So for each one of these cycles, I have to manipulate her to attack as fast as possible. And a jump attack is the fastest way to repel the energy balls back at her. She has two attacks she can do, the dash and the triforce attack. And Jimmin's gonna manipulate her to always do the dash because it's you can cancel it with your shield and it just makes her attack again with it. So he's manipulating the flight times in between attacks and he's also manipulating the attacks that are being done. Yeah, so like all this random movement that we're doing is to manipulate that. God, that was fast. <laughs> now it's time for Ganon, or Ganon 4 as I like to call him. By attacking his belly in a certain pattern, uh, we can deal the maximum amount of damage in two cycles and get a faster third cycle where he spawns immediately. Now we can get a pretty good look at his mouth. Up close and personal. As well as just watch him run into the ball and chain. It's time for the horseback portion. 
pretty much we just need Zelda to shoot Ganondorf uh, with the Bow of Light three times. And we unleash a spin attack. And obviously we want to be as close as possible. But over these last two cycles, we can pretty much be right next to him when Zelda shoots. God, that's nuts. Wow, that's so fast. My god. It's insane. So fast. Now we just have one thing left to do. Beat Ganondorf. Also, this text here is broken, so we're going to leave it on screen while we fight Ganondorf. Something that I believe is only on the German version, also. Jump slash quick spins. And he's down. At 2 hours 33 minutes and 10 seconds. It's not GG. GG, dude. That's like one. Absolutely amazing. We also put on the iron boots uh, right before we did the final attack because that has some funny implications in the credits. Yeah, speaking of credits, um, I recommend everyone stay around because the credits are actually screwed up quite a bit um, due to some of the things that we skipped in the regular game. So we'll be looking out for those. But yeah, that was pretty much the entire Twilight Princess task. We just have some uh, text that we go through later in the credits. So uh, this task, as I said near the beginning, uh, it began on March 15th, 2016, and it was finally finished on January 3rd of 2018, so it was almost two years in the making. I actually, uh, like over the winter break that I had between my school semesters, I actually pretty much solely dedicated myself to doing this, which is why I was able to finish it. Uh, at the time that I did. I probably spent about a hundred hours or so over my winter break just working on this Twilight Princess task. Because for the first, like, year and a half or so, it was kind of like an on and off thing that I was doing. So, so yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed that. And we'll, of course, be watching the credits all the way through, because that's what we have to do. We're also going to find out right now that Link does not skip leg day. Because currently, we finished um, the Ganondorf fight with the Iron Boots on, and so now the game isn't going to unequip uh, the Iron Boots. Also, just a note about the credits, um, <laughs> dumping and trying to sync up the audio and video for this task was a huge pain in the rear, uh, because the audio and video actually dump at different rates, and they can vary at time to time, so I have to like manually sync up the audio uh, for the video file that gets produced. And uh, one thing that I forgot was that, um, like I said earlier, there's text that we're going to view. Um, like 12 minutes into the credits or something. So, um, I didn't actually sync up the audio for the credits, so the audio is going to be like slightly ahead when we get there. But since most of it's just like background orchestration music, uh, even though it's desynced slightly, it's uh, fine for the most part.
I'd also like to take this time uh, to thank all the people that were, like, like I made this task alone by myself, but there's no way that I could have done it uh, without the input of, like, the whole Twilight Princess community, as well as their continued support for this uh, giant project. I'd specifically like to thank uh, Dragonbane Zero, who was with us on commentary today, for providing the version of Dolphin that I used uh, to make this TAS. Uh, for those who are familiar with TASing, um, you're, you might be surprised to find out that throughout the entirety of making this TAS, I only had one desync happen to me throughout the entire thing, and that's thanks to Dragonbane's version, or Dragonbane's Zelda version, or Zelda edition uh, of Dolphin. I would also like to thank uh, Fino thank you, and Rick. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Dragonbane. Uh, I would also like to thank um, Fino and Rachel for being the pioneers of Twilight Princess tasking so many years ago. And it's because of what they did that I've learned how to task Twilight Princess as well as I can. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> it was a pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because yeah, back when you did it, um, or yeah, back when you did it, like desyncs were a lot more common, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we we lost uh, many good uh, testing sessions to desyncs. Yeah, I'd also like to thank the Task Videos community on the Twilight Princess forum for being supportive of the project also. So uh, this will be submitted to Task Videos for anyone who's curious, as long as it can sync on someone else's machine. Uh, but I got it to sync on two of my own machines all the way through, so I'm hoping it'll be fine. Oh yeah, the re-record count for this was 99,086 re-records. From uh, another tool that Dragon Bay made called the DTM Editor, uh, which displays useful information about the DTM file that gets created when you test. Also, just a fun fact, um, I did go through this run and count up how many individual rolls there were. Uh, there were exactly t uh, 1,080 rolls in this task. If someone wants to proof check me on that, you can go ahead. Oh yeah, unfortunately I didn't count the number of bonks. I mean, bonks... I'm assuming there are fewer than, like, 15 bonks or so. I mean, rolling is something that happens, like, everywhere. Yeah, so let's see if anyone correctly guessed the final time here. All right, let's maybe see who got the closest. We had 109 individual responses. Bunch of 232s. Uh, Adam guessed 233.33. The closest one I've seen so far. Oh, 233.17 from Adi. 
420 is 69, nice. 45 hours. <laughs> that was a bit of an overestimation by whoever guessed that. Thirty-three twenty-eight. Let's see, Ritz. I have to go through thirty more here. So since uh, uh, task video's timing uh, does all inputs, um, there's actually still uh, the timing would still be going on here, and it would actually end in like three or four text boxes from now. Yeah, it kind of sucks that the test video's timing ends like 12 minutes into the credits. So I think from what I saw in all the results, uh, the closest guess was Adi with the 233.17. As for the summary, the most popular answer was 2 hours, 22 minutes, 22 seconds, and 22 milliseconds. By like 3 or 4 people. Yeah, so the task timing would have finished there. Credits aren't quite done yet, though, so we'll still go through them. Now, there is still one kind of funny thing coming up here. Uh, it's gonna happen. That I think, I think, or no, it happened earlier, but we didn't mention it. Because Midna went away, Link can't warp back. So now Link has to go fight Argrok if he wants to get out of the Arbiter's grounds. Oh yeah, the <laughs> uh, Faron Woods is messed up because he never cleared the Twilight. Yeah, so <laughs> even in the credits, uh, we still see the Twilight effects happening in Faron Woods.
video player glitch right there. There's a splice. Spliced in the credits. Spliced in the credits. Amazing. See the messed up trailer once again. <laughs> the, like the... just casually riding into the darkness. <laughs> One last time. Thank you very much, Fino and Dragonbane, for the co-commentary. It was a blast doing this with you guys. Yeah, no problem, man. And I hope all of you guys in chat enjoyed the tasks. But, uh, yeah. So that's it for the tasks. I'll be leaving this Discord call now. So, do you guys think we're done yet today? I mean, I don't know. I, 